Good morning to all of you. I want to begin this morning with sharing with all of you a word of God's amazing grace, a word of his hope, his promise, his comfort for us this day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Thanks be to God for this word of his amazing grace this day. Now it's my uh, privilege to introduce to you Mr. Don White, who's going to come forward now and sing about God's amazing grace. Yeah. 
Friends and family, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of William B. Venables, Jr., Bill, as we knew him. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human laws. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow hope, and in death resurrection. We're going to pray, and the prayer this morning is printed in your bulletin and feel at liberty to kind of recite this along with me as we pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you, especially this day. We praise you for Bill, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all who have gathered here, grant your peace. Let your light shine upon them and help us to believe that your presence will lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, a home that is eternal in the heavens through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen going to have some reading from the Holy Scriptures, one from the Old Testament, then another from the New Testament. From the Old Testament today, we will be in the book of Psalms, Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. And please feel at liberty to recite this with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in a house of the Lord forever. Now, this morning, from the New Testament, I'm in the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, selected verses. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled, Believe in God, believe also 
in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I've said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This time, it's uh, again my privilege to introduce you to Mr. Don White, who's going to come forward now and sing a song about that old rugged cross on Calvary's Hill. Yeah. 
him and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my truth is at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some for a crown. Thank you, Mr. Dom White, for those two beautiful songs for us today. Two songs that Bill had requested one song about God's amazing grace that saves us and a second song about a cross on a hill showing us how he did it. At this time, we're going to have some words of remembrance, and I want to introduce to you uh, first Mr. Rick Phillips, who's going to come forward and say a few words. Rick, please come forward. Good morning. For those that don't know me, I'm one of Bill's nephews. Before I speak about him, I would like to... Uh, recognize another very special person that's here with us this morning, and that's Sue Messick. Sue was Bill's caregiver, and believe me, being a caregiver for Bill Venables was a daunting task. <laughs> she also cared for Aunt Joan. Sue was much more than a caregiver. She became a friend, companion, and sometimes confidant to Uncle Bill. She cared for him like one of her own. Thank you. I was blessed with the most amazing parents anyone could imagine. I say that proudly now, but 53 years ago, I would have probably told you they had no idea of what they were doing. <laughs> they were caring, supportive, and always encouraged me to give my best, regardless of the outcome. Being the oldest of five, I certainly didn't receive all of their attention. They loved us all equally. Fortunately, I was lucky to have another person in my life who taught me a lot. He was my Uncle Bill. Though it would be impossible to describe his wonderful life in a few words, I would like to share a few observations and personal experiences that I will cherish for the rest of my life. My first haircut. I don't know this for fact, but folklore has it that he gave me my first haircut sitting on a ping pong table in our basement with a bowl on my head. <laughs> <laughs> my first working experience with Uncle Bill was probably like the rest of my nephews, all of us who had a uh, <clears throat> summer vacation experience working for the construction company. <laughs> Some of us work for Uncle Bill, some of us my grandfather, some of us Uncle Bill, and Cousin Anthony was probably tasked at some time to babysit one of us. My first job was working over at the guard shack at the Seaford plant. He gave me a sledgehammer and pointed to a brick wall and he said, knock it down. I banged on that wall all day long. I think I finally got it. I heard Uncle Bill use the word love only once in his life, but he loved me. I can say that for sure, and I loved him. 
But his blessings were not restricted to me. They extended to each member of the family. Oh, my, my, my. The house on the hill. Everybody talks about the house on the hill. What an accomplishment for one individual. Not many people have seen the inside of the house on the hill. It wasn't built for gratification or any other reason to show off or be bold or brave. It was a labor of love, and he enjoyed doing what he did. I can only describe what I see in there sometimes is somebody had an immense talent. He had a lot of help, but all the finished work and things inside, I know he did personally. Unbelievable. The pool behind the house. Uncle Bill opened that pool and maintained it every year, mostly for relatives that enjoyed the water. Snacks and popsicles were always available. I never saw Bill or Joan in that pool. Never. But one day, a few years ago, Bill, fully dressed, fell into the deep end of the pool while cleaning it. With little strength and the, wet, and the weight of his wet clothes, he struggled to reach the ladder where he hung for quite a while. Finally, he was able to pull himself out and wait on the deck until Aunt Joan got back home from one of her many excursions. He described the event to me this way. He said to me, Ricky, Bill was really the only one that continued to call me Ricky. I don't know why. I became Rick earlier than that. He said, Ricky, I said to myself, sweet William, you finally done it. <laughs> no need to yell for help. No one's home. If you don't pull yourself out, you're going to die. Fortunately for us, he pulled himself out. <laughs> the old farmhouse behind the house on the hill was home to several nieces and nephews fixed up and maintained. Most probably no rent was ever expected. Another tenant came along in the greenhouse after they all moved out. Um, a gentleman, a longtime employee of the construction company, came over uh, some hard times and ill health. Uncle Bill and I fixed the house up once more for somebody to stay in there. Uncle Bill paid the utilities, provided a little bit of money here and there for, for necessities, and that gentleman passed away in that house, not to be occupied again. But in the recent, recent months of the years, Bill had it in his head he was going to fix the house up again. This time he was going to let a homeless veteran live there. Never, ever wanted to give up. His artwork, most would assume those beautiful paintings and other art in the house, took him weeks to complete each one. To be honest with you, most of them were done in only several hours. Amazing ability, a great gift. We were cleaning out the garage a while back and we came across a box of scrap stained glass sitting over in the corner, covered with dust, dirt, mouse droppings, you name it, nasty. What are you going to do with this? Throw it away. For some reason, I said, I might like to try this. So I loaded it up, took it home, cleaned it, started messing with it, got pretty good at it. When I'd finish a piece, I'd take it to Bill because I wanted his approval. He was tough. <laughs> that looks a little rough. <laughs> I understand. It's my first piece. Finally, after many attempts, I got his blessing. That's pretty. I think you got it, Ricky. Oh, my, my, my. He left me a gift that will last me for a very, very long time. Bill had a very large circle of friends. They came from work, horses, golf. And fortunately, a lot of those friends became my friends. Uh, speaking of golf, self-taught, excellent amateur, self-appointed president of probably one of the longest group of golfers in Sussex County. They played every Sunday and every Wednesday. 
sometimes starting at 8 o'clock, playing until dark. Bill was the handicapper. If a new face showed up, they had to have a handicap, and Bill was the one that assigned it. Often in protest, a new golfer would complain about the number, and Bill say, you have potential. <laughs> Always teaching everybody. He knew what was going on. Probably his biggest excitement in life was his horses. From the time I was 16 to the present, we messed with horses. We shared many up and downs together. He had a lot of homebred horses and just loved doing it. Taught himself to shoe horses, taught himself to train, he even knew a little bit about veterinary medicine, if you could believe him. Um, we shared many ups and downs together. But in 2004, Uncle Billy came across the opportunity to purchase half of a nice little filly. At the time, probably one of the premier trotting fillies in North America. Rare for a hometown guy like Bill. Loved that horse. Turned out to be just as good as she thought she was. The horse would race in Canada, the United States as a two-year-old and a three-year-old in some very lucrative stake races. Early in her career, she raced in Canada a lot, and the only place she could watch the race was in Canada, or there was an OTB site in Cambridge. So every time this horse raced, we'd load up and go to the OTB. Bill excited as could be. On one particular night, Jersey Gal happened to win a very big race. Bill so excited, I thought he was going to swallow his dentures. <laughs> he said to the crowd, buy everybody a drink. A little old man came over to him and says, sorry, sir, I don't drink. Could I have an ice cream? <laughs> Bill says, buy him a double dip. <laughs> Always on guard. And a little more on Jersey Gal, as the next year went on, there, there, there's a race in harness racing, particularly for trotters, called the Hamiltonian. Well, the Hamiltonian is the Super Bowl of horse racing. Just like the Super Bowl, the Hamiltonian has eliminations. You start with a lot, and you dwindle your way down to a few. Jersey Gal was entered in the female version of that, which is called the Hamiltonian Oaks. The purse for that race was dollars. In her elimination, Jersey Gal was star of the field, had the quickest elimination time of any other horse. So on the finals the next week, we load up, we ride to the Meadowlands, and Bill is flirting in harness racing heaven. He's there with who's who in harness racing, the best of the best. And here's little old Bill right in the middle of it. We had shirts with Jersey Gal on it. We had the whole mess, big food, you name it, it was a day. The race starts, had the same driver on her that we had the week before, Jersey gal racing just like she did, got to the top of the stretch, and Jersey gal started walking, finished dead last. Standing behind Bill and Joan was one of the most amazing sights I've ever seen. They just couldn't believe what happened. It was a long ride home from New Jersey that day, <laughs> needless to say. But it didn't end there. He took Jersey Gal and started breeding her, bred her four times to probably the, some of the top studs in the country, had four wonderful babies, all of them making the races, all of them trotting better than two minutes, loved in each and every one of them. Jersey Gal still stands today up at Jim Walls' farm, a good friend of Bill, where she'll stand forever with one of her babies, and Jim has bred her a couple times. Uh, love that horse. Uh, one, of the, one of the horses was uh, Wingus, the final one. Uh, still racing today. Races Wednesday night, as a matter of fact. Uh, so we're anxious to see what happens there. Uh, Bill, would, <laughs> Bill would visit every Sunday. His good friend John Dykstra would come and get him, and we'd take a ride around the country and stop by the barn. And Bill would feed him ginger snaps. Loved his ginger snaps. On a recent trip, I think Sue took him, Bill took the horse some ginger snaps, gave him, took a couple out of his pocket and let the horse lick him. He put them back in his pocket. 
On the way home, they went by the cemetery, and he stopped by Joan's grave, and he took these ginger snaps and placed them in the flowers. What an amazing man. One of the other things Bill liked to do was uh, design and lay out racetracks. He did several tracks in Sussex County and southern part of Maryland here, some of them for some very, very, very well-known trainers. His friend Tink Laird would drive the grader, and Bill, and sometimes I, would do the survey. Pretty, pretty big task for a man his age. I can, I can remember him crawling across that field trying to get it done. Let's see, what else can I tell you folks? Protest marches. <laughs> the last few months, everybody's aware of the turmoil going on in this country, and most mornings we'd sit down and discuss world fairs, and out of the blue said to me, while we were discussing one of these massive marches, he says to me, Ricky, where do all these people park? <laughs> Never passed through my mind, but a legitimate question. Where do they eat? And most importantly, where do they use the bathroom? <laughs> Bill Venables. Bill Venables, strictly Bill Venables. Never forget, never forget. 32 acres of grass. Most people that live on a property like that might lay out an acre, an acre or two of grass. Not Bill. He had to cut all 32 acres multiple times every summer. He was able to do it himself for a while, and then it got so that he couldn't do it, and then it fell on me. And a couple times his good friends John and Jim came up with their own tractors and helped him cut this grass because he was, just didn't want it to look bad. It needs cutting now. <laughs> the last project Uncle Bill and I did was the Jones Hill Monument. Last spring, on a visit, he showed me a picture of a stone that he had ordered that said Jones Hill. He said, Ricky, we have to lay this out. Well, at that time, we meant me. <laughs> So I arrived the next morning, he had out his string lines, his levels, his squares, his tape rule, and precisionly measured, we came off from the house and laid this stone perfectly within the center of the house. Mark it, ordered the, saw, ordered the stone, came in a couple days, put it in, a couple weeks. He sat out there, just sat out there in the hot sun next to this stone. A couple of weeks later, I showed up and he says, Ricky, we have to move that stone. <laughs> he said, move the stone. He says, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> and again, we met me. <laughs> he wasn't happy with the placement. So all over again, we get out all the tools and materials and we move that stone a mere 25 feet. Now we're talking eight to 10 acres of land. We get it all where he wants it. All the measurements are complete, rules, tapes, whatever. As Bill would normally do, he said, wait a minute. And he walked around behind the stone and he looked at the house and he looked at me and he goes. <laughs> so I moved it about an inch and he was happy. The new stone was installed to, to complete the story. One thing that surprises me is Bill wasn't a very good gardener or had very, very little interest in flowers and plants. He had picked out what he wanted to do with his garden, and knowing a little more about it than him, I said, this isn't going to work. You don't have any water. You don't have any of this. You don't have any of that. And his, his reply is, what's so hard about planting flowers? All you got to do is dig a hole and put it in the ground. Sweet William. <laughs> so anyway, he bought half a dozen, dozen plants, and I was out there one Friday morning, and it must have been 100 degrees. And I'm digging holes and planting plants, and I said, I'm never going to get this done. And over the horizon comes Cousin Beth. <laughs> I was rescued. I finished what I was doing, and she came and finished the garden, which turned out to be very pretty. And Uncle Bill spent countless time out there. Every morning he would stop and say how pretty it was before he went to the cemetery. Uh, wow. Before I finish, I'd like to sh might suggest to everyone here 
If you have an older relative, a friend who's ill, homebound, or just living alone, go visit them. These folks are still alive. They need human interaction. Everybody here can find 5, 10, 15 minutes every couple of weeks. Take the time. Make a visit. Make a call. You probably won't even have to talk. All you got to do is listen. Don't wait until today. Do it. And that subject brings me to mind one of my fondest memories of my Uncle Bill. Years ago, when my first wife, Beverly, was very ill at home, Uncle Bill always expressed his caring and concern. But he never came to visit. Instead, every couple of weeks, he'd show up the door with a bag of fried chicken from the Laurel Deli. <laughs> I think being uncomfortable with the situation, he never came in, always saying, I don't know what else to do, so here's some chicken. <laughs> and off he'd go. On the subject of chicken, Uncle Bill could never understand why some folks like Popeyes, some folks like Kentucky Fried Chicken, and other people like chicken from the deli. To him, fried chicken is fried chicken. <laughs> oh my. Uncle Bill will remain an award-winning uncle, and I will always remember him as a second father. He's one of the reasons I turned out to be the person I am. He might be gone, but his legacy lives on in the many lives he affected, especially mine. In closing, if I can get to the page. I'd just like to say, he is still with us in the leaves of the trees that he planted, in the plants that bloom in full swing in the season, and in the shade of the enormous oak tree that we all so deeply love. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rick, for those wonderful words. Uh, at this time now, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Bruce Venables, who would like to share a few things. Can you hear me okay? You know, I... Uh, I've been given a privilege to speak about Bill Venables. And I've struggled all week. Should I write things down? Should I say this? Should I say that? And Rick, you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> Do you know, I didn't write it hang down, and I had two mentors in my life. One's not here today, Brother Bob and Brother Bill. Bob taught me how to hunt and fish. Bill taught me how to throw a ball, how to run, how to be a man. You know, a lot of you might not know this, even some of the family. The first 18 years of my life, I shared a bedroom with Bud Bill. He had, I don't remember much prior to him coming home from the Navy. But I would say, you know, around eight, nine years old, Brother Bill was bigger than life, laying next to me when I went to bed at night. And I've got some stories I could tell you 
<laughs> Some of them I can't. I was an honor young and I was always into something I shouldn't have been into, always in trouble. Mom always had a switch in her hand. Dad always threatening. I had a, I had caught, I don't know where I caught it, but I caught a little lizard, a little, called a fence runner. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a lizard about that long. And I had it in a shoebox, and Mom let me keep it in the bedroom. And one day, I couldn't find that lizard. I looked everywhere. Mom helped me. We looked everywhere. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. So it just, you know, gone. So I went to bed that night, and Brother Bill came to bed a few minutes after. And he got in bed. And all of a sudden, he started squirming and jumping. <laughs> And, I mean, and saying some words probably, I, you know, I can't repeat here. <laughs> and that lizard was in his bed. <laughs> I think if Mom hadn't been there that night, I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but, but, you know, he kind of got over it. Another time, at, I guess, I was 16 years old. And I... I, I don't know. When, when, when my father got out of bed, everybody got out of bed. Nobody, I mean, I'm up, you're up. Well, anyway, I was giving him, my father, I was giving him some smart mouth, smart 16-year-old mouth, which I knew better, because he, but I did it anyway. And about the third smart thing came out of my mouth, I saw Brother Bill come storming in the bedroom and he grabbed me right by my collar, my undershirt, he picked me up, he said, if you say one more damn word to my father, I'm gonna knock the living hell out of you right here. And I was so scared, I didn't know whether to move, I didn't know what to do. But I never said another word to my father, I guarantee you that. You know, who was this man, Bill Venables? Sweet William. Anybody know how he got his name, Sweet William? It was his golf swing. Because he had one of the most beautiful swings. Actually, he had about a thousand swings. And he'd use them every time we played golf. He would use a thousand swings. And none of them worth worth a damn. Excuse my... <laughs> but none of them were worth anything. You know? And he could hit out there with the best of them. Bill was my brother. And more importantly, he was my friend. And he always treated me like a friend. He didn't treat me like a younger brother. And he never told me he loved me. I don't remember until the last few months I ever told him I loved him. But we did, and we knew it. For years, Brother Bill asked me, play golf. And I'd look at him straight in the house, I'd rather watch grass grow. I just, you know, I just couldn't see it, you know, and then finally I got into it. And I soon found out, well, you know, man, this is about the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. And he helped me and he helped me. And I, I probably was playing, I don't know, two years before I had enough courage to one Sunday morning go with him with the Laurel Boys. And that's what we were known as, the Laurel Boys. And as Rick said, he was the unofficial president of the club. And we would play from sunlight almost till dark, 54 holes, go back and do it next week, or you know, the following Wednesday, whenever it was. But the one most remarkable memory 
that I have from that experience is the honesty, the sincerity, the cherish of friendship for one another. When you played with these guys, and I think Brother Bill had a lot to do with this, when you played with these guys, you were honest. You were sincere. You didn't play with them. And Brother Bill would see to it. Everybody that played golf in that group, and it was my honor to be one of them, not as good as they were, but I was I would go out and play with them. Bill was loved. They looked at Bill, wouldn't give him an honest bet, but they looked at him, and it was almost reverence, the way he was thought of. You know, Brother Bill was kind of a glass half empty guy. You could have a conversation with him and he, he, he could present the negative side better than anybody you'd ever talk to. <laughs> but you never felt like he was being negative, even though he was. Because at the same time, he was positive about so many things. When we were in business, you know, two people really amazed me in our, in our company. And that was my brother Bob and my brother Bill. They had the uncanny ability, and I'm not saying it's rocket science, but they had the uncanny ability to take a set of construction documents and analyze them, and they could tell an architect or an engineer what was wrong with those documents, what wasn't going to work, what would work, whatever. And Bill had this amazing ability to be able to confront architects and engineers with, this is wrong, this is not going to work. And believe it or not, he would convince them. And it, it just absolutely amazed me. They also had the uncanny ability to be able to figure out a task and develop it to completion the most efficient and best way. You know, where, where do you get that ability? You know, I, I don't know that they had it. Bill, Sweet William, was a master of so many things. He was a master electrician. He held a master electrician's license most of his life. He was a master builder. Like I said, he could figure out, he could lay out the most complex building. And Tony, you know where I'm coming from. I mean, the ability to do that is, is amazing. He was a, what I would call a master painter. If any of you have seen his artwork, it's absolutely amazing. He also was one hell of a golfer. Now, Bill would deny any of that. He was a very humble man, very humble. Never really talked about himself at all. But he never hit a good golf shot. Never. I never knew him to hit one. And he turned right around and tell you, he said, that, that wasn't anything. That's nothing to that. <laughs> I would go out to his house and I would say, Bill, these paintings, do you have any idea what these are worth? He said, these are so unique and, and they're so 
great. Yeah, they're not worth anything. They're not worth anything. Yeah. <laughs> that was Bill. I'm going to miss him. You know, the last few months of his life, and I'm very guilty of what Rick stood up here and said. I didn't go see him the way I should have sometimes, and I'll forever regret that. But the last few months of his life, I tried to go out and see him as much as possible. And you know, he, he never talked about the Korean War. And all the years we lived together until I moved out at 18, and he never would talk about it. And here's a young man from little old Laurel, Delaware, floating around on a destroyer in the Yellow Sea off the coast of Korea. Didn't know squat, scared to death. And he's standing in line to get chow, and all of a sudden, boom. He said, Bruce, I was next in line, and you had to step down to go into the galley on the ship. He said, I was next in line. If I had taken one more step, I wouldn't be here today. And all Every individual who was in the galley, I think that's what you call it on the ship, died, dead. And he said, Bruce, I woke up and I couldn't see sunlight. I said, why? He said, because people were piled on top of me. I had to dig my way out from under dead people on top of me. I don't know how you reconcile that in your mind, in your heart, but he did. Like I said, he never spoke of it until the last few months of his life. But to get up from that, to, to get up from that experience and become the man that he became is an unbelievable task. I failed and I'm remorse again. I want to thank one lady here. Her name is Sue Messick. Thank God for Sue. She took care of Brother Bill when it was tough to take care of Brother Bill. And the other individual is the guy that stood up here before me, Rick Phillips. Rick, I say this to your face, thank you. Your love for Brother Bill can't be measured. And, you know, Jeannie, thank you so much. For Joan and for Bill, you spent many hours many, many hours with him. And I've babbled on long enough. Brother Bill, I know you can hear us. I know you're with Joan. I know you found her just as soon as you got where you were going. Mom and Dad and Barbara and Betty, Please say hello, tell them we love them, we miss them, and we'll all be together, it won't be too long. And I want to thank all of you for coming today. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Bruce and Rick.
thank you so much for those very personal, heartfelt words that have allowed everyone here to really know Bill Venables today. Thank you for that. Um, to all who are here, I want to say that Bill Venables has gone home to be with Jesus and Joan <clears throat> to live in the glory that is God's kingdom and the joy that is his heaven. He had a long battle with illness on this earth, but I want you to know that he has been set free from all of that. The prophet Isaiah put it this way, that those who put their trust in the Lord shall fly like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not be faint. Bill has entered that promise, the promise that Jesus made to go and prepare a place for you. Did have a wonderful time talking, Faye, and um, I, I just uh, want to say that I realized I had a real connection to Bill that I didn't even know that I had. For, as you were sharing, Bill went into the Navy right from high school, and in fact, uh, forego his graduation to go. And it was during the time of the Korean uh, War. And it had to have been out of a sense of duty to go and serve that he did that. I identify with that because I went into the Navy right out of high school, too. However, I went in in a time of peace. Bill went in in a time of war. I also want to say that as Bruce was sharing about the incident on the mess deck in the, in the chow line, uh, that Bill received a Purple Heart. And let me say to all of you, I personally consider that the highest medal that anyone can receive. And he is a holder of the Purple Heart, you know, Jesus said that there is no greater sacrifice than to someone who would lay down their life or give themselves uh, for others, and that is what he did by going into the Navy. Uh, I also learned that when he uh, came out of the Navy, he uh, worked for a cabinet maker or worked in cabinet making, and I identified with that because when I came out of the Navy, I went to work for a cabinet maker. From uh, talking, uh, learned about uh, W.B. Venables, and uh, that through that there are uh, several landmarks that are out there that kind of has Bill's stamp on it. And I want to mention, too, that really uh, leaped out to, to me. I know there are numerous ones, but one was a Coast Guard station. And the reason why I love that is because uh, a Coast Guard station is essentially a life-saving station. It is for those men and women who take the boats out when those who are out on the sea are in trouble. And the second is the stadium. I love that because I love baseball. And second, because my last name's Purdue and it's called Purdue Stadium. <laughs> the thing is, at that time when that was being built, uh, I worked for the Board of Education as a head custodian at Glen Avenue Elementary School. I lived just on the other side of Hobbs Road, and so I drove by that uh, uh, construction site 
every day going back and forth to work and now realized that every day as I was driving by there, Bill Venables was out there seeing that being built. God has a wonderful way of working things out. The last thing I really want to just lift up to you, I uh, was talking and uh, it came up about the fact that Jesus was a carpenter and I uh, was asked about that and I said, yes, it's truly mentioned in the gospel of Mark and in the gospel of Matthew. The words that are said was people were looking at Jesus and saying, isn't that Jesus the carpenter from Nazareth? But here's the thing. The original Greek word that is used there when it refers to Jesus as a carpenter is, and forgive my pronunciation of it, but it's the Greek word tiktom. Is that Jesus the tiktom? The reason I bring that up is because that word means so much more than carpenter. The actual word is probably best synonymous in our language with the word uh, contractor, tradesman. It meant that not just someone who was, uh, a, could be a carpenter, but in that culture it was someone who could also be a stone worker or someone who could work with metal. And as Bruce just shared, uh, a bill, no, was he a contractor, a carpenter, a master electrician, a, a licensed plumber? He could do all those things. But here's the other exciting thing that I learned from that word. It also kind of means artist. And what a wonderful word to describe the legacy of Bill Venable. Someone who heard the call to go serve his country, someone who was awarded a Purple Heart, someone who worked as a contractor, this carpenter, master electrician, plumber, as, as Hussein could look at a set of uh, construction diagrams and just see the flaws and see the right things about it. I believe The ability to do that came from God. <laughs> Bill leaves a legacy for all of you. First, whatever you do, do it with excellence. Whether you're supervising a construction site, you're playing golf, you're raising horses, whatever, or painting a painting, do it with excellence. Do it as if you're doing it for the Lord. And second, through the long battle that he had uh, with his illness, he leaves the legacy of the words of Paul. We have fought the good fight. We have finished the race. We have kept the faith. Bill specifically requested today that at this service, the song Old Rugged Cross would be done. For those words say, I will cling to the old rugged cross till at last my burdens I lay down. I'll cling to that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Be comforted, family, friends. In God's glorious plan, there's a reunion coming one day and we'll never be separated again. And I don't know for sure, but I've heard there's an amazing golf course up there. <laughs> I'm quite sure you'll know where to find Phil.
Oh God, all that you have given us is yours. As first you gave Bill to us, now we give Bill back to you. So into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant Bill. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive Bill into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. And now let us all pray together the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray when he said these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the services here at church. We invite you, if you're able, to follow us in procession to Oddfellow Cemetery, where he will be laid to rest beside his beloved Joan. So if you don't mind at this time, would you please rise in honor of Mr. Venables? Thank you. <laughs> 